Green to Genty. Genty's going to dive in from the two, and he's got the touchdown. Ashton Genty with another rushing touchdown, and Boise State ups the lead to 13 to 6. Green play fakes to Dubar, throws the ball left side, goal line, touchdown. Eric McAllister on the 28 yard scoring strike. Green just threw it on a rope right up the shoulder of McAllister, who hauled it in for the score. Third and five. Schuster had trouble with the snap and will be sacked. Benefield, the freshman who carried out the hammer, was there. And it'll be a punting situation for the uh, Fighting Hawks after a seven-yard loss on another sack for Boise State. Well, for the first time this season, we got good news to talk about. Welcome on into Jay Sports Bar. Jay Tuss alongside Shane Williams-Rhodes. The Boise State football team is off the schneid. They get their first win of the 2023 season, 42-18 to over North Dakota. Not too far off what you predicted last week. A few more points uh, uh, scored, a few less points allowed. Uh, but either way, Boise State finally getting some momentum here in 2023. What did you make of that victory on the blue, early morning victory on the blue? on Saturday last week uh, I did not like the early morning game that was <laughs> pretty terrible but outside of that I thought we played a solid game not a great game but a solid game mm-hmm. uh, struggled uh, in third quarter obviously yeah. um, I wouldn't be surprised if you hear or see them practice and halfway through practice this week sending them back in the locker room and then sending them back out to make it you know, obviously, to play the role of we're coming out in the second half, we got to start fast. Mm-hmm. So expect that it might be coming. But yeah, we outside of that third quarter, I think we played well. Uh, what we always talk about is we got to find a receiver who's going to step up. The guy we thought was going to step up stepped up. Mm-hmm. We're starting to get a guy, so that's good to see. Uh, Genty is Genty, uh, even despite you know the two fumbles. I mean. It's tough because he doesn't have the ball just loose. It's high, right. it's high and tight when it's getting pulled out. So uh, it's, that's a tough one. But, yeah, I mean, t- I thought Taylor, to me, played – he played a – I'd give him a 7.5 out of 10. Okay. Uh, I think some of the – some balls he just missed. His pick, obviously, those are still going off of our chest as receivers, and mm-hmm. it's killing me. Uh, but outside of that, I think he extended plays. He made – plays he didn't try to do too much yeah I want to talk about Ashton uh again he, he's been so productive this year he, he comes up in front of the the camera this week though and he takes ownership of the fumbles we're going to hear from that in a little bit we are going to talk about Eric McAllister as well as he had a career day against North Dakota you have some young guys really rising up on on the defensive side of the ball too Marco Notriani Andrew Simpson uh, a backup safety named Ty Benefield that's going to be a household name I believe before too long here in Boise but let's start with the play of the quarterback and that is Taylor Green and you know after the game Andy said he was really pleased with the way that Taylor moved used his legs and I, I think so often times that you know when we talk about Taylor it's on these designed runs and can he can they dial up something for him where he can go get you know 60 70 yards to complement 150 200 passing yards in a game but in this case a lot of it was just him finding a way to pick up five, six, seven yards on um, a play that he kind of improvised at the end instead of maybe throwing into traffic or forcing something or throwing the ball away. He is the fastest guy on the field. Like when his straight line speed, he's, he's going to be the fastest guy on the field almost every single game day, uh, regardless of whether it's Boise State or the opponent. But you look down tw- uh, 18 of 29, he had the pick, not his fault. 188 yards, a touchdown with his arm, a touchdown with his legs, and at the end of the day, 35 net rushing yards. You take away the sack, 47 rushing yards, most of it, again, kind of on plays that he improvised on, though. Yep, I think uh, – I know a lot of people want to say we want to see Taylor run more. Well, when he runs on design runs, he obviously is going to be taking some hits Yeah, because he might not be in a position where he can slide if he's going between the tackles or that. But when it's plays where – things are breaking down and receivers and DBs are way down the field and backers are dropped mm-hmm. in coverage. This allows him to get to the sideline, get out of bounds and still get first downs. We saw a lot of that. So I totally loved the way he handled that. He wasn't forcing things. He was getting out of bounds. He was getting the first downs, mm-hmm. taking what they were giving him versus forcing some things. Obviously some throws got away from him. I know he wish he got a few back, but uh, yeah, it's, 
I think it was overall a solid game. I think I was res- I was impressed with the way that he responded because it it didn't really start great for him. He was five of his first eleven for only like I, I believe twenty eight yards. But from there on out, he he finishes the game by completing 13 of 18 passes. And um, the completion percentage is, is notable. It was over 62 this last game. When he starts for Boise State, the Broncos are 9-1 when he completes at least 50% of his passes. That leaves them 0-3 when he falls b- below that threshold. And so it is important for him. It, it, it it, it keeps the offense on track. It keeps him ahead of the chains or at least not behind the chains. And I just think – I thought you saw him take a nice step forward, and I can't wait now to see how he uses that going into the San Diego State game. But I, I thought overall Talon played a pretty good contest, back, bounced back from, from some resiliency early. And I think that one thing that I noticed is on his touchdown run uh, to begin the game, afterwards he kind of strolled into the end zone – and then it was like he was kind of like walking halfway across the end zone. He's like, it, the light almost went on. Like, oh yeah, this is supposed to be fun. And he found a buddy and he danced and you know whatever. But I think that's the biggest thing for me with Taylor. I liken this to like a baseball player, right? When you're trying to like work on your swing and 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 really hone in on some of your mechanics, sometimes you just think way too much, right? Yeah. And so you know, I, I know that you want him taking from practice what he's learning and in, in working on in practice and putting it into a game and utilizing it. But at the same time, like when you're dropping back, you can't be thinking, where's my elbow at? Where's my hands at? Am I loading too yeah. far as it pertains to baseball? You know, you can't just go out and play free, man, because he's an athletic freak, and he's shown that he can do it, whether it be throwing or running, previously in his Boise State career. And I think we just saw a little bit of a glimpse of that. And now as the Broncos head into Mountain West Conference play, I want, I want the whole view. I don't want a glimpse. I want the whole view of yeah. it. Yeah, he's got to be relaxed. I think maybe he was just locked in. I'm mm-hmm. hoping that's why, you know, he uh, <laughs> celebrate. But, yeah, I think. That, pro- that probably was it. <laughs> that probably was it. But. I'm sure hoping that's what it was. But, yeah. Yeah, he, he got better as the game went on, uh, even on his deep balls. There were some earlier in the game, you're like, geez, like, that's a big miss. Mm-hmm. Like, 10, 15 yards in front of the receivers. And then he comes back in the second half, and now he's just dropping some in the, yeah. back, in the basket. His touchdown pass to Eric McAllister – he could not have called timeout, froze everybody on the field, walked mm-hmm. it there, and put it in a better spot. Yeah. It was an absolutely perfect throw, and that's what I'm talking about. Like we know he can do it, and I, I just he needs to, you know, hopefully he's operating with the confidence that he can do it. But I, I, I think that as we've kind of start, we, we've kind of got a, a little bit of a um, glimpse of the character that Talon is, and like he is like a fun guy. Mm-hmm. Like he he's dancing on the field at practice sometimes, not when it's like inconvenient by the way but it's just like keeping it loose yeah. and keeping it fun i feel like that's probably an important part of his game like i know that everybody's like you got to be dialed you got to be focused but yeah. like i don't know imagine if like tyreek hill didn't celebrate after a big catch like yeah. and just like walked back to the huddle like that wouldn't be his game yeah. right he's he's just being himself yeah so comfortable ho- hopefully we see more of that i, I think because I, I think that's good for him uh the guy that lines up next to him he has been an absolute force yeah for this um Boise State offense this year if you look at his FBS ranks six total touchdowns second in the country tied for second in the country um yards from scrimmage per game 146 that's third in the country touches total touches 64 that's seventh in the country he's proven that he can be explosive handle the workload and uh bounce back from adversity which again i'm going to get to that in a moment but i just don't know where this offense would be you played with guys like jeremy mcnichols jay ajay i mean he's he genty could do something that even those guys couldn't accomplish um and that's right now he's the only guy in america with over 200 receiving yards and over 200 rushing yards his versatility is insane. And, I mean, if, if you go, want to project that out over 13, 14 games, this dude could legitimately be a 1,000-yard receiving guy and a 1,000-yard rushing guy. I think Brian Westbrook, I'm not positive, but Ooh. I think Brian Westbrook is the only guy that's ever done that in college. And he was at Nova, I think, which which is, which is was FCS. Yeah, you went way back. To way that. back. That's like 98, I think. I can't even remember, but it's something along those lines. It, it would be statistically – one of the most unique seasons in the history of college football, if he can maintain this pace. Yeah, you know, I just worry, like you said, maybe a week or so ago, 
him doing something like that, we'd have to do a lot <laughs> to keep him here because he is a dude. Yeah. He's absolutely a dude. I think the thing that was cool about him, like even you know his three rushing touchdowns this season were tied for the most of week three in college football. But I think the thing that was most impressive, um, he had a couple of fumbles. And, you know, I don't know how many people requested for Ashton to talk this week because in our minds as media members, sometimes we think, yeah, oh, we talked to him, you know, three, four weeks in a row. He's done a great job of being a representative of the program. But that many weeks in a row, maybe he deserves a, a yeah. moment to just, you know, breathe and we'll, we'll get him after the next game. And he comes up there and he owns the fumbles. And to the point, I, I walked away and I was like, wow. Not only is Ashton sharpening his skill set and becoming a better player, but he's also becoming very more – I think he's taking a big leap when it comes to his maturity. Take a listen. We're lucky to be able to win the game and uh, have that many turnovers. It's completely unacceptable, and I have to be better. I take ownership of those fumbles and those mistakes, and I have to be better than that. You know, I got a lot of people counting on me, players, coaches, and, you know, they're going to keep putting me in the spot to make plays, and I have to be better. Hand off Genty right side. Genty will get to the five. Genty to the four. Keeps his balance. Did he score? He stretched the ball out. It just shows you that low center of gravity, that great balance, that great lower body strength. That's just my play style that's my mentality i mean that's that's what it takes to be a, a great running back so moving forward i just have to be better at um securing that ball we have this thing where we say double in trouble which you know when there's a bunch of defenders converging over you take that offhand and you cover up that ball so that nobody can pull it out so i should have done a better job at covering the ball up during those times most of the time a player makes a big mistake like that your coaches they they lose trust in you in a little bit right there, I feel like. Obviously, I had some time to reflect on my mistakes, but yeah, after such a critical error like that, you're usually not gonna go right back in the game. That's all I'm focused on this week is being better with the ball, and I will be better going into the next week. So he said that, you know, he kind of had to uh, learn his lesson, and the coaches maybe lost a little faith in him for a second. like. Um, I think that's a really harsh way because I think the coaching staff has a ton of confidence in this kid. But it is what it is. You lose two fumbles in a game, mm -hmm. you're probably going to have to go watch from the sidelines for a little bit. Yeah. How does uh, that How does that conversation happen? Well, it's not a uh, not a light conversation over there on the sideline. I bet it's. But yeah, they 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 get they get fired up a little bit on the sideline about those, especially because they probably work it every day in practice. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a period that we actually have, so the ball security period. So. It's just it's like I said, it's tough. So when the guy's actually carrying it the way he's supposed to and the ball's still coming out, that's when it's like, all right, well, you know, now they gotta start covering up with two hands yeah. and traffic, those kind of things. So it's just a lot that goes into it. Uh sometimes it's from guys just having bad ball security, but when your ball security is good and you're still fumbling, that's when it's it's tough as a coach to yeah. kinda rain down on that. Well, and, and I know that everybody's gonna say whether you're a coach or a player, like ball security is the number one thing. I always but, said uh, ball security is job security. And I get that. <laughs> but you know what also is job security? Uh, breaking three tackles down near the goal line, using your hand yeah. to, to stay up off the turf and still stretching the ball out over the goal line. And I know his knee went down right before mm -hmm. on that seven-yard carry, and he scored um, you know, uh, on the very next play. But like that's also job security, in my opinion. I mean, the, the kid can, is really special. But sometimes, like I don't know, like – can you really have both the best of both worlds all the time? If you're really going to run hard, if you're a guy that has um, the athletic ability, the instincts to be able to put your hand down on the ground mm -hmm. while ball carriers, I mean, we slow this down and it looks so simple. The game is happening at a million miles yeah. an hour and he's still able to do that and make a really good play. Like, can, can you really have the best of both worlds 100% of the time? No, it's, it's like when you – when you used to play video games, right? You get the strongest character on the game, but that means he's gonna have a big weakness over here. Mm -hmm. Or you get, you know, a weaker character, but they're gonna have, you know, a more secure and balanced type speed and those kind of things. So, okay. You know, you're you're not gonna always get, you know, get your cake and get eaten yeah, too. <laughs> yeah. I just I was impressed by. I mean, we've all been impressed by his production this season because it's it has been off the charts, but. Um, 
I, I was really impressed by his maturity bouncing back from that. And uh, one more uh, little tough stat that I want to point out. So there are 80 FBS players with, with 200 yards receiving right now. Mm -hmm. Ashton Genty is one of them. If you rank those 80 players based on rushing yards, though, Ashton Genty has 202. The next closest guy on the list has 35. Yep. His, his versatility is just insane. And when I talked with Ashton a little bit earlier this year, he mentioned that uh, James Montgomery – uh, I'm going to actually bring up James Montgomery here in a second. Uh, but he mentioned that James Montgomery has him sit down and watch running backs and even wide receivers because he's so versatile. But I said, who's the guy that you really like to watch? And he said, Christian McCaffrey. And I'm like, wow, that's like the ultimate of ultimate versatile guys, right? Like sure. he, he's, he had a thousand yards rushing and a thousand yards receiving in the NFL. And I, at the time, I think I was like, eh, he's feel, still feel like Ashton's a little bit more of a running back than maybe Christian is is, is a wide receiver. And then I'm looking at it through three games, and I'm like, oh, man, a hell of a comparison right there yeah. because Ashton might be on – Ashton's basically on track to do in, you know, 14 games what Christian did in 16, 17 games in the NFL. It's, it's unbelievably impressive. Um, I wanted to, to actually talk about James Montgomery. Uh, goes by Jimmy, J-Mo, uh, depending on who you talk to. When, when Boise State lost Keith Bonifa, I'm not going to lie, man. I thought that was a huge loss because yeah, Keith, Keith is a man. I, I mean, he, he's a dude. Like, he, he recruits well. He develops talent. You look at his track record. It is consistent with everywhere he has ever gone, right? Yep. He's put guys in the league. Um, and when they lost him, I was like, man, how do they replace that? Also, he's just very experienced. And they bring in James Montgomery, who went to my alma mater, Washington State. So immediately I was like, well, he's going to have it figured out. <laughs> But he, he, he was a young guy that didn't have nearly the track record of a guy like Keith Bonifa. And you look at what he's doing with, that, with those running backs. I mean, right now, if, if you pay attention to who's suiting up and who's not on the sideline, mm -hmm. at, at the beginning of the year, they had seven running backs at their disposal. And on Saturday, they had Ashton Genty, Caden Dudley, who was banged up the pre previous game, mm -hmm. True freshman Breezy Dubar, and now they have brought uh, a cornerback, a true freshman walk-on named Troy Wilkie, over from the cornerbacks to serve as their emergency running back. That's my guy. Uh, Troy's a, Troy's awesome. You know Troy? Yes, I do know Troy. Tell me, tell us a little bit about Troy. Uh, very explosive. Uh -huh. So uh, he's a guy in space. He will make you miss. Yeah, he's not. He's not a big guy. He's not big, but he will make you miss. And he's a strong too. That's the other thing. Mm -hmm. he, you can probably see from his build. Just if you ever saw him, like in a muscle shirt, he's he has a little build. To he him. also has like an unbelievable work ethic. Yep, and totally the I'm I'm gonna bet on myself, and I'm gonna win type of guy. Now he's a he's a true freshman walk on. So I'm not saying he's gonna come in and like have a hundred yard game or anything mm -hmm. like that, but. Um, it is just one of the cooler underlying stories on the team right now that I've pointed it out a few times on social media because I, I do think it's really remarkable. A true freshman walk-on that's really forcing or earning opportunities. But James Montgomery, man, like he has these guys ready to go one way, one way or another. And the running back play, it's it's been about as consistent and as good as it gets, I would say, when you look at any given position group on the roster this season. Yeah, it does, and it's – I don't know if I've ever seen us be able to be this deep, you know. Mm -hmm. You have – just with Dubar being number three to start off the year, that's – that that kid came in and played well. Yeah. I think he had, what, 10 carries, about 60 yards. So he's averaging he six led, yards a carry. He led the team in rushing, 62 yards. He yeah. also had three catches for, for seven yards. So um, whether – actually, I, I want to say Ashton still clipped him. Well, Eric McAllister was way out there, I guess, in total yards from scrimmage. But either way, leading the team in rushing, mm -hmm. 13 touches. He's been on campus for three months. Yeah. Um, and, it, again, it's – he's really talented. But I still what, – what James Montgomery do, is doing with the running back group – Really stood out to me. And so this week I asked Bush Hamden about it. Dubar with a run up the middle. Zigging and zagging. Gets to the 10. Another first down. Gain of 12. As a coach, you want to make sure that you're always building that depth. So if situations like this do happen, guys aren't shocked. They already know the information. They can go out there and play fast. Jimmy is as good as a position coach as I've been around. He's just a guy that knows all three levels. From an offensive standpoint, the pass game, the run game, the protections, um, and again, 
his ability to connect with guys is, is so big, certainly at the college level, and I think there's a lot of trust built there with all these players. At times, you got to know when to push a little bit, when to back off, and uh, he's really done a tremendous job with all those guys. Now, when we talked with James last week, I mean, we don't know the exact lowdown on, on injuries, and that's just something that really isn't discussed. But hearing him talk about how they need, they're going to need Breezy Dubar now. Yeah, I I'm going to guess that George is still going to be out, you know, a couple of weeks here, and so he's still going to be working with guys that are, are relatively young. Um, I mean, there's this just hit me too. There's there's not anybody older than a redshirt sophomore that he has at his disposable disposal right now in the, in that running back room, because because even T Crow, mm -hmm. who's one of the toughest football players you're ever going to meet in your life um he was out last week you know yeah. so i mean they are really young at that position but somehow james montgomery is getting them to play at a very very high level i do think that he benefits from having talent there but just when you hear him talk about how he coaches guys and breaks down the game and doesn't want to overwhelm his players so that they can mm -hmm. play fast i think it's a big reason why you're seeing a guy like breezy dubar having so much success early in his career yeah i totally agree and i think that while George is out, allowing Dubar to get, you know, more reps mm -hmm. and still possibly be able to hold that red shirt, I yeah. think that, that could be big. I it could be. I I'm gonna guess the red shirt's out the window. Like he's think so? I, I do because he's he's gonna prove to be too valuable. And I just don't know if George is gonna make it back in time. And even if George does, like Breezy, I think he's warranted that you need to find a couple of touches for him a game. We go back and we, we talked about this after the UCF game. And I kind of pulled Ashton aside this week after his press conference because I just wanted to make sure. I had a snap count at 62 out of 67 against UCF. I mean, that's 92.5% of the snaps. That That is a massive usage rate for a running back that has to run between the tackles. I mean, not, I'm not taking anything away from wide receivers, mm -hmm. but they're not – they don't have to run between 300 pound guys play yeah, after play. Right. For sure. And so he said that, you know, he really, that 40 to 50 snap range is when he still feels like he's, he's fresh. But once you start to get up over that 50 threshold, it's by the way, it's not like he's not willing to do it because if he yeah. prob kid would probably never leave the field, if he was never asked to leave the field, but this is college football. Once you hit that 50 snap threshold at running back, you start to feel it a little bit. So if Boise state's averaging 65, 70 plays a game, that means that, Moving forward until until George gets back, you have Breezy Dubar and Caden Dudley that have got to figure out a way to basically fill in for 15 to 20 snaps. And on top of that, it's, it's really probably a few more than that because going into the season, we can now tell that Boise State really thought highly of their talents at running back because they put two running backs on the field quite a bit right now. And yeah. so th there is some overlap there. So you're probably really looking at between Breezy and, and Caden Dudley you know, you probably need some in one some one combination or another. You probably need those guys to divvy up 25 snaps, maybe even a little bit more. But I'm, I'm going to go 25 snaps in order for Ashton to be as 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 fresh as he needs to be and at his absolute best. Yeah, I was looking at it more as carries. I think 10 carries for Dubar is great. I yeah, think what they did this week that was enough because they still had Gentry involved in the past game. Yep. So you got to think about that. So take some of those in between the tackles type runs away from him and give him more of the perimeter swing routes, some of those things, the screens and all these things to get him on the perimeter. Because now you have Gentry against a cornerback and a safety where he's already already breaking tackles on linebackers and linemen. So you put him out there, I think that's why he's been so effective. It's tough for those guys on mm -hmm. perimeter to tackle him. Okay, let's go to these wide receivers now. We're going we're gonna to work our way through this here because um, there's – Easy topics to talk about, and maybe more complicated ones. The easiest one is Eric McAllister has his breakout performance of the season, and really maybe as a Boise State football player. Six catches on eight targets. Love the efficiency there, especially when you consider how often they're targeting him downfield. I looked this up, and he has he's been a tar he's been targeted eleven times on throws of twenty or more yards this season, tied for most in college football. So they Jeez. love getting him out there and trying to stretch the field with him. But against North Dakota, he catches six of those eight targets, and he does so for a career-high 143 receiving yards. What do you think makes him so effective, Shane? I think the fact that he's a 6'4 receiver that mm -hmm. can run, that changes a lot of things. So, you know, the guys I play with were like Aaron Burks and Geraldo mm -hmm. Oldevine. So 
Aaron Burks ran like a 4-3, so he was fast too. But this kid, he has some really good ball skills. It's it's different. Yeah. you. If you want to look at um, – Eric's a sophomore, so if you want to just look at, you know, the best receiving performances from week three in college football – uh, he, he's great for a youngster, but if you rope him in with everybody, he's still amazing. So ninth most receiving yards in college football last week in 143. His yards per catch, 23.8. That's a massive number. That was tied for fifth most um, for anyone with at least five catches. You know, there's a couple guys that caught 140 yard or so. Minimum five catches on that average uh, yards per, per reception. Two uh, touchdown catches, tied for third most in the country. He had five first down catches, tied for 13th most in the country. When quarterbacks were targeting Emac, uh, because um, Maddox Matson did throw him a touchdown there in the fourth quarter, but when Boise State quarterbacks were targeting Emac, their QB efficiency rating, 307.7. Now, that'll, that'll put you in the Hall of Fame quickly. <laughs> so yes, so th- he was a, a big time difference maker. And, you know, I, one thing that I kind of noticed, Shane, and I went back and I looked at um, the season opener, and, you know, it's so funny because who I'm trying to think of who we I had this conversation with early in my career here. It might have been Matt Miller. I can't I can't remember when he was a player. But when you when you have a speed guy and you call him a speed guy, sometimes they can get offended because they also feel like, oh, I can be a possession guy. And then when you call a possession guy a possession receiver, they're like, Hold up, I can take the top off of the defense, yeah. you know? So the, it's always, you know, you want to be that that complete package. But sometimes you also are what you are and, you, like, your value to the offense, too. And in the season opener, Emac lined up 11 times in the slot. The last two games, he's done it twice. Yeah. Can, I, can you tell me what that means? Because I, I, clearly um, him being out at that X position and stretching the field is, is carries a lot of value to this mm-hmm. to this offense. And if he can't do it, Who's the guy that does it without taking Emac off the field? You know what I mean? So yeah. what, what, what does that mean exactly? You know, putting him in a slot, it, it's kind of a personnel thing. So obviously if you're going three by one, you want him on the backside. Because if they're, let's say, they're going man and they're going cover one, that safety is going to typically rotate over to help the three-man side. Yep. So when you do that, now you have him on backside one-on-one and he's fast, he's tall. So that's huge. But since he's been so effective, mm-hmm. you'll start seeing people go cover two. So now you're pulling another safety out of there who can't get involved in the run game. So that's helping having him play X. But then if you go against a team that, that are going to man you up, but they have really good corners, why not? That's when they typically move them into the slot. So now you have safeties guarding them. Mm-hmm. Safeties aren't going to be fast enough. So it it's all about personnel and being able to – put guys in good positions. I mean, you see Devontae Adams and you see Tariq Hill. They Those teams do a great job of moving those guys mm-hmm. around. I think Tariq Hill is freaking going in motion every play just so he can't get pressed, right. which is smart. If you can't press him, he's already fast, so he's getting a running start. And then Devontae Adams, you're moving him in the slot. So now you got Nichols trying to cover him when he's, you know what I mean? He's Devontae Adams. Yeah. So I think just being able to move, move, that, move those guys around, I think that's what they're mm-hmm. doing. And so I think obviously teams are going to catch on to it. They'll start having guys travel. Yeah. And just wherever he goes, you go. But I think they're doing a good job of moving him. It'll be interesting because uh, we'll we'll get to San Diego State here in a little bit. But they have one of the better safeties in the conference. He's already got three interceptions. So that's somebody they'll have to look out for if if he is trying to you know help out on Eric McAllister stretching the field a little bit. But um, yeah, I, I I think that Emac took a massive step forward, and everybody knew that he was capable of it. Like. We've, I've said it since the begin, beginning of the season. Like when people are like, "Who's your breakout player?" It feels silly to say Eric McAllister, but like I think at the end of the year he's going to threaten a thousand receiving yards. So considering yeah. he had you know a little over two hundred last year, I'm, I'm okay with saying that he's going to be a breakout player. You know, I yeah. think he is. What does, he, does he already have that? What's that? Oh yeah, he's already over what he yeah, had last so, year. Yeah. And and now he also took over the team lead in receiving yards. He stole it so, from Genty, huh? So he stole it from, Jet, from from Ashton for now at least. But it's nice to see a wide receiver probably leading that that sure. stat. I would, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. Um, another thing too, I, I think that Steph Cobbs has done an okay job in the slot this year. I I, I do. I, I think that there's some things that are out of his control. I mean, last week they threw the ball at him eight times. He only had three catches. Uh, he didn't have any drops. One of them, too, like he took a massive loss because he came back way behind the mm-hmm. line of scrimmage to help out Talon. So um, if you just want to look at 
what Steph was, you know, on pace to do over his first two games. It was about 60 catches for 744 yards and six touchdowns. If if Boise State gets that out of Steph Cobbs this year, like you take that to the bank any day of the week. Like yeah. that that would be amazing production out of him. So yardage down a little bit this last week. We'll see how he uh, comes back against San Diego State. The guy that everybody really wants to talk about is Prince Strong. He is a six five true freshman receiver that he gray shirted last year, so he has been on campus now for. Eh, almost nine months because uh, he was a mid-year mm-hmm. guy that, that, that arrived um, from the Bahamas. He, he had a 26 yard catch in the, you know, the first time that he was targeted, mm-hmm. uh, I think in his college career uh, last week. And it looked awesome. Bush said it's one of the nicest plays that he's seen a receiver make this season. Then it was the only time he was targeted, you know, the, the rest of the game. So, I think the co- the conversation becomes as, as fans. It seems like they they want to see Prince play more. I, you have to have the talk of what's realistic, though. Mm-hmm. He says on you know he stands up this week and Prince said that he feels like he knows the playbook well and he, and he feels comfortable. But but you've been in a position like this before, especially because you played yeah. early. I mean, you, you were you even a mid year enrollee or did you get here during the summer? Summer. Okay. Uh, june 8th yeah okay so you get here june 8th and you're playing on on august 31st or whatever yeah early september oh michigan state i was in michigan i was gonna say michigan (laughs) state yeah um man what a hell of a way to oh actually yeah i remember that game gosh i've been covering this team for way too long because somebody accidentally put the ball on the ground that game and didn't jump right back on it i'm just kidding we don't need to bring up old memories a learning experience I'll, i'll never forget that you know hey maybe this is a great example though because, like, as much as you're trying to learn, like, there are little things like that that happen where mm-hmm. you probably never would have even – that would never happen to you as a senior, right? Mm-hmm. And so now Prince, a true freshman, on the depth chart, he is the backup at X to Eric McAllister. You're not taking Eric McAllister off the field. So how do you put Prince Strawn on the field in a way that actually, like, is realistic? Yeah, I think what – fans have to understand is when you come in or when you come in and you play and you're young saying you know the playbook might not be the same as a senior or a junior and yeah. saying they know the playbook it might be saying i know what i have on every play but i don't know what the guys on the other side or the guy inside of me gotcha has. there's 10 so, other there's 10 other guys on the field yeah so i mean i was definitely a victim of that you know because I was such a gadget player my first year, mm-hmm. I was like, well, I don't need to know these other positions because I'm not playing those other positions. Yeah. And so then I get to my sophomore year and the workload increased heavily. Mm-hmm. And so it was like, okay, you have to know where everyone goes so we can move you in other spaces. And he might not be in that space yet. It's tough to know. Everyone's different because then you have guys like Matt Miller who come in and he knows every position as a freshman and he's able to play they put him in the slot they put him outside so everyone's different but but matt was also a redshirt freshman this is true so i mean he still had a year to marinate this is very true and 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 so that and plus he's with all due respect good sir he's he's the best i mean if you look at his catches yeah. and his yardage and all that stuff you, you could very easily argue mm-hmm. he's the best in school history 244 yeah. catches all-time record uh he had the receiving record before thomas spurbeck i believe passed him um and so yeah i mean he he's yeah. a, one of the best but i think another thing too is I hate being critical of players, but I think it's pretty fair to say, you know, Billy Bones has gotten off to a tough start this season. And I think even Billy would admit that. Um, He was their leading receiver last year. He has clearly had success on this team and in this offense, but it hasn't gone as you would hope so far. And so you see people saying like, we'll just take Billy off the field and put Prince on the field. Billy plays Z. Z is a very important position, obviously in an offense and it's probably complex too, for that matter. Um, you probably want a guy that is experienced playing there. So to say that a backup at X could just go over and be your starting Z and play yeah. seventy snaps, what what is the likelihood of that actually being the you know being possible when you're talking about a kid that's a true freshman? That's where your acumen comes back in. It's like, does he have the acumen to be able to go over to the other side and mm-hmm. know what they do on every play? whether it's personnel up, whether it's, you know, in the run game. Like, he may be a guy that, yes, he's familiar with what to do in the pass game, but 
we have Ashton Jensie, so we're yeah. going to do a lot of running. So he needs to be able to get involved and know what he has to do on those kind of plays yeah. too. So it's that playbook is not small. I'm going to tell you guys that. Yeah, if you, you got to block. I mean, there, yeah. there are screen plays that – Involve misdirection, so not only blocking, but angles of blocking and all this stuff, right? And that's the other thing. It's the experience when it comes to blocking because you can be big, but if you don't understand the angles on blocking, then they're not going to put you out there, especially if you're literally out there to block. Yeah. So, I think I think Prince Strawn is, has an unbelievably bright future. We get to see him out there at practice, <clears throat> and at times he, he looks unstoppable. But I think there's also going to be a, a progression to this, a developmental mm -hmm. process. And y yeah. I'm confident you're going to see more and more of him. But mm -hmm. I just don't think it's realistic to say, just put him out there for 70 snaps a game. Yeah. And, and if there's anybody out there that wants that, I, I just don't – you should probably change your thought because I just don't see that one way or the other being, being realistic. If, if anything, it seems like Chase Penry would be the guy that would see, receive mm -hmm. a bigger increase in playing time. If they're they're you know eating into Billy's snaps just because yeah. he is a little more experienced, uh, he's been around the college game a little bit longer, and you know in times he has been productive. I, I do have to point out that he was in street clothes at the end of last game too, so yeah. we'll we'll see how that looks going forward, um, and definitely in the immediate future taking on San Diego State on the defensive side of, of the ball. You know, pretty impressed, I would say, by Boise State. They gave up 86 yards in the opening quarter. And, you know, North Dakota goes down, and um, it looked like they were going to tie the game at seven, but they missed the PAT. And it just kind of felt like, man, is this going to be a long afternoon? Is it, is it going to be a long afternoon? Yeah. And from that moment on, again, 86 yards in the first quarter alone, 97 the rest of the way. And, yeah, sure, you look at the fact that they gave up 18 points, but two of those came in extremely short fields mm -hmm. off of turnovers, right? Uh, on one of them, too, they converted a fourth and seven as well. North Dakota did. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, outside of that opening drive touchdown, the defense didn't allow much of anything the rest of the way. What did, what did you think about the defense who had been burnt on for a number of big plays, gave up, gave up a, a ton of yards to two really talented offenses in the first two games, but seemed to bounce back in, in game three a little bit? I thought they played well with the competition that we had. You know, that's – Giving up only the 97 is what we expect from, mm -hmm. you know, the team we're playing against. Uh, we went against some f pretty good offenses the yeah. first two weeks. So, I feel like they got thrown in the fire, especially mm -hmm. for a defense that's as unexperienced as we are. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this week, though, I think is going to be a big challenge because, you know, it's it's going to be some – <laughs> send me some tough football. Yeah. They're going to try to run it down our throat. Yeah, that's what San Diego State does. I, I just – I think it was a game that the defense needed to have. They played a lot of bodies, and it sounds like an excuse, Shane, and that, that's fine. But Michael Penix Jr. could be the first quarterback in college football history to throw for 6,000 yards in a single season. Like yeah. he's, he's that good. He's been that consistent. He torched Michigan State in East Lansing this last week. I mean, it, it, <laughs> it was – He's yeah. he's a Heisman. He's not in the Heisman case. He might be or in the Heisman conversation. He's he's one of the front runners. I mean, he's he, he right now. He's he has to be top three. I don't see how he wouldn't be. Then UCF, they put up 600 yards of offense last week, and they did it without their starting quarterback. So I mean, those those really are two offenses that are as good as Boise State's going to face. Yeah. Now they, they face a San Diego State team, though, that, you know, they're, they're, there's not going to be the luxury of that excuse. Physical, absolutely, mm -hmm. but not necessarily explosive. And their quarterback, he, he's definitely done a decent job for him, but, I, man, he just feels like he's a converted player. Like, after yeah. they, they moved him positions to play quarterback after the Boise State game last year when they were really struggling at that position. So he still feels a little bit more like an experience than a guy that – you know, really, really scares you. Uh, but before we do move on to the Aztecs, I, 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 this, you know, whether it be Marco Notriani, I mean, no DJ Shram, mm -hmm. we see that happen pregame, and I'm like, oh, God, that's not good for a defense that's been struggling. Marco is, is a guy that I don't know if there's anybody that I can compare him to, but he moves well. He's a little bit longer, I, I would say, than some of the other linebackers. And um, 13 tackles, a forced fumble. Uh, he was very, very impressive yeah. against North Dakota. That's big, and you love to see that when 
one of your basically your leader of your defense goes out, mm -hmm. and then you know the backup comes in and plays that well. Because now what happens is you're gonna see both of them on the field together. Yeah. You know, you start moving guys around and trying to get those guys. So you got two guys running around like that. That is great. Yep. And and uh, on top of that too. Now Andrew Simpson's also in the mix, and we talked about this. I think actually on the opening week of our podcast, how. I feel like Andrew Simpson is going to start to be a little bit of a playmaker on this defense and how they use him. And they're sending him more with pressure. And you, you kind of see the way that he can bend. Oh, yeah. You know, and um, I don't want to, you know, this to go too overboard in terms of a comparison because Curtis Weaver is one of the, he's one of the best pass rushers that we've seen. But even for a guy his size, he just had a really unique ability to bend yeah and i mean like most guys it seems like they would fall down or something like that but he's just got andrew just kind of has a similar little thing to him mm -hmm. about how bendy he can get and so i think you're seeing the 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 stud position a little more traditional with their their hand down now instead yeah. of being up and potentially dropping mm -hmm. they're making it a little more simple and just allowing those edges to just go north not yeah. really worry about southeast and west mm -hmm. and now maybe andrew becomes the guy that you know, he's a linebacker, so he drops into coverage, but maybe you send him and um, try to figure out a way to, for him to be your chess piece. Yeah, I agree, and I think he came Excuse on me. strong. It was good to see him out there. Um, I do think that having him back and then, you know, hopefully we can get DJ back mm -hmm. this week. That'll be big. If we yep. get him back, uh, I think that plays into our, the, the strength for mm -hmm. us because I think we're better at stopping the run, obviously, than the pass. Yeah. So getting those guys back, going against San Diego State, that's yeah. that's huge for us. Yeah. Um, another guy that uh, has has really started to burst onto the scene is is Ty Benefield, and he this is a name that not a lot of people know probably in Bronco Nation yet. Yet, but you're going to know soon. He had a sack in last week's game. He also had one of the biggest hits in last week's game. Um, I, I caught up with Dimitri Washington this week. And mostly Dimitri's just a senior leader. So I was like, I, I wonder what his thoughts are on Ty Benefield. And honestly, the, the praise that, that Dimitri gave him exceeded my expectations. That dude's going to be very, very good for Bronco Nation for a very long time. I mean, that's someone who's been here for three months, makes insane plays and watch his development from week one, wait till the end, by the end of the season where this guy's at. I mean, we haven't, we haven't seen a lot of people like him at this university in a very long time. Since I've been here, there hasn't been a guy as talented as him coming in and he's a freak and he's gonna work every single day like as a young guy being able to like be as attention to detail as he is and he wants more every single day and I mean you're watching clips and it's like hey like when effort clips it's like hey let's play like Ty here whether that's on kickoff you see him he's usually that first one down it's either him or Zion every single time and I think being a young guy he's not afraid to go in there be able to throw his head in and now you're gonna see him he gets more and more time in more and more like gets more and more seasoned it's gonna be fun to watch him play so for a six-year senior to, to tell a, or to talk about a true freshman and say he's one of the best talents. I mean, Dimitri really didn't sugarcoat. Like he, he said that he's the best talent he's seen in his time here. That is crazy to hear that out of a six year senior talking about a guy that's been on campus for three months. That's good. That shows that we have some things coming up in the pipeline. Right? Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm excited about Ty Benefield. He's, he's a great player. Um, sometimes when we talk about the young guys too, I, the, the old guys might feel lost in the conversation. Rodney Robinson has played better these last two weeks for sure. And things that people don't see, oh, I, I can't even, I don't even, I lost count of how many times at practice, Shane, after Ty Benefield would go through a rep, that Rodney would pull him aside afterwards and say, you know, look at this with your feet or wh whatever mm -hmm. it was. I was blown away by Rodney's leadership, especially for a guy that plays the same position as him, mm -hmm. wants on the field. There's only so, snap, so so many snaps to go around. I was blown away with, with Rodney's uh, communication with Ty throughout practice. I thought it was one of the coolest things that I've, I've seen at practice, um, to be honest with you. That's got to come down just to a culture thing. Yeah. Like, you got to understand that, you know, if you get hurt, you would want the guy that's going to come in for you to be able to respond. Yeah. And, play just as well as you do so that's big you but, know not a lot of people you know buy into that side of it but. yeah let's let's i mean call it what it is though i mean like this is sports and they're and we're all competitive right and so whether it be an opponent or your own teammate you're going to want to maintain a little bit of an edge like that just because you want to make sure that you're 
you're staying on the top spot of the depth yeah. chart. And so for somebody to, to, to really display that, man, what a selfless human being that is unbelievable for your program. I, 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 I want to offer praise there. And I know Rod isn't the only one. I think that you see guys like Billy Bones doing that to young wide receivers as well. And that's why when people get on some of these guys, it's like, gosh, if you, if you only knew the, the whole story, like you might kind of change your tone at times, but um, those are some, that, that was something to practice that I just had to bring up. Cause I know I wanted to talk about Ty Benefield today, but I couldn't, I didn't want it yeah. to be like, we're, we're not talking about Rodney. Cause I was really, really impressed with, with that by Rodney and Rodney's going to continue to play great too. I mean, he's, he's a big piece of that defense without a doubt. Um, so we'll, we'll see who is available on defense this week. I, I don't know if they're going to be at full health. There might be some guys that, Hey, maybe even fans have wanted to see get on the field a little bit mm-hmm. more playing this week. We'll have, we'll have to wait and see, but when it comes to San Diego State, Shane, the Aztecs always have a way of playing up for this game. They always give the Broncos their A game. Whether it's here in Boise or down in San Diego, you look at their all-time series record against each other, 4-4. Four and four. This is a matchup. It will be physical. It will be hard-hitting. You are going to have to do the little things right in order to come away with a win on Friday night. Yeah, this... This game, man, it's it's tough. I, I think I might have lost to San Diego State two or three times. They are tough. I wasn't going to bring it up. They just seem to <laughs> always have a game, great game plan to go against us. I mean, they played Idaho State, and I think they might have won by one possession. Uh, 36-28. One possession. Yep. But they're going to they're gonna come, and we're going to play us, and we're going to get a totally different team. Yep. It's going to look like a whole new roster. It's I just it's crazy. I don't I never could understand that. You look at the last time Boise State went down there. They had a great half. It was I, I believe it was Black Friday. I know it was right after Thanksgiving, and um, Boise State has a great first half. They build a lead, and then San Diego State just hit them with a landslide and went went won that game going away. And now Boise State makes their you know first trip down to San Diego to play in their new stadium, which will certainly be cool. I, I know I'm looking forward to that, and. Um, I, I just, I just know this game is going to be tough. Like it's, it's going to be physical and I go back and, um, gosh, I think it was 2016, 2017, you guys are coming off the BYU game and, uh, the, the team was struggling a little bit and everybody thought that San Diego state was going to just going to, you know, go hand it to them. Cause it was, a, they had to go back out on the road again. And Avery Williams had a, a young Avery Williams had a punt return for a touchdown, and mm-hmm. Boise State played a great game on defense, won 31-14 or 31 14 I believe. And so they, they need that they need that tough gritty effort this yeah. week down there to, to to lean on your defense to match their level of physicality, and then on the offensive side of the ball, you know, go between the tackles and get after them. And you know, last year's game was such an interesting game because. San Diego State was up. Boise State was debuting Taylor Green as a starting mm-hmm. quarterback. They had yeah. a new offensive coordinator who's one of the best new offensive coordinators you could probably get in Dirk Cutter. Mm-hmm. Um, Hank Bachmeyer had just transferred out of the program. Yeah. The team's coming off one of the worst losses in history uh, of the program. You could argue the worst loss in the history of the program. And then all of a sudden, they go in halftime, they come out, they run like a variation of five plays in the second half, and they – they blow San Diego State out. I will say this. I would expect San Diego State's defensive ends to play a little wider this mm-hmm. week. Taylor yeah. Green burnt them a number of times on the edges last year. And, and they and you've seen and, and you've seen a number of uh, teams so far this season play those DNs wider to try to to, to keep Taylor Green in the pocket. But you're right, too. That's another thing, too, is that um, Taylor's going to have to mm-hmm. have, have a lot on his plate of dissecting pressure and things like that this week. They are going, they are going to bring pressure, and they're going to tell – basically say – if you want to throw it and beat us, throw it because mm-hmm. we're going to bring pressure, we're going to stop the run, and we're going to force this quarterback to beat us with his arm. I mean, that's what I would do if I was San Diego State too. Yep. Well, you, you got to. There's the challenge, right? So Boise State, a uh, Friday night game, the first non-Saturday game of the season, 8.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, the Bronco Roundup game day show will be – Live on Channel 7, a full 90 minutes before kickoff. Got an extended uh, show this week. 90, 90 full minutes of, of uh, preview in this game. Should be a lot of fun. I head down to San Diego tomorrow morning, and um, I can't wait. San Diego is one of my favorite trips. Laramie, I hate going there. It's on the exact opposite end of the spectrum of this trip. San Diego, always enjoy this trip. You don't like Laramie? I hate it's Laramie. such a great place. It's, God, it's so bad. <laughs> We'll save that conversation for uh, later in the season. Thank God we don't got to go there this year is all I got to say. 
but it's been fun, Shane. Boise State, the, the climb begins. This is conference play kicking off this mm-hmm. week. The ultimate goal, it's written all over their facility, in the team room, win the Mountain West Conference Championship. That chase begins this week in San Diego against the Aztecs. It has been fun, Shane. I appreciate you as always, buddy. And we will see the rest of you next week, same time, same place, on the Sports Bar, serving the Idaho sports community.